We can calculate the distance to a star by using a method called spectroscopic parallax. Now this way may sound really, really fancy, but it's actually very straightforward. Um, and that's what I like to call this the apparent brightness and luminosity method. Now this method um, it uses this property of, you know, if you have, let's say, you know, a candle. Um, so I'm just going to try to draw a candle right here. There we go. And let's say uh, here is the observer. And so if this is you, the observer, I'm just trying to draw a person right here. If you're sort of watching this candle, assuming you had, you know, two candles that had the exact same brightness, let's just assume that. Well, then if you had two candles with the exact same brightness, what I could do then, I'm just trying to copy and hopefully paste it, yes. Uh, what you could do then is you can compare what they'll look like if one is sort of further away. So what we would do then is use this idea that, okay, if I'm actually looking at this candle right here, assuming they both have the same luminosity, let's assume they both have the same luminosity. Okay, so this luminosity here is the same as that luminosity. Remember, that means uh, what the power is. In other words, how much energy does this thing emit per unit time? So if we look at this candle right here, it's going to look brighter, right? This hopefully makes sense. But again, that's because they both have the same luminosity. And this one right here then will appear dimmer. In other words, we have this, this property that if they both have the same luminosity, but one actually appears dimmer, we can say then that that one is actually farther away. And that's actually why, because distance ends up making things look dimmer. But again, this is not so simple because stars don't all have the same luminosity. So you could have, uh, for example, a star that appears really, really bright, but actually could be just something that's really uh, a dim star, in other words, a not very luminous star, but it's just really, really close to you. Or you could have a star that's really far away, but extremely luminous, and they might actually appear the same brightness from Earth. So in other words, when we look at them, we'll think, oh yeah, they're the same brightness, when they're really not. So we can tell the distance between things if we can assume something about their luminosity. Now this is often a problem because in order to know something's luminosity, you'd have to sort of go there to measure it. But we can use a really good trick, and we can use some of the tools we've already been putting together. So let's first of all talk about what the different steps are for finding distance using spectroscopic parallax. Well, step one is to take the spectrum. That shouldn't be a surprise. So take the spectrum of the star. And again, remember that means take the light from the star and split it up into its component uh, colors and look at the different, um, the different transitions that are possible. So you're gonna see these little lines. So in other words, if you take the spectrum of a star, you break it up into, this is the wavelength, and you'll see some sort of, you'll see some sorts of lines somewhere. You know, different patterns like this. And by looking at this spectrum of the star, that tells you something. Okay, the spectrum of the star can actually tell you the spectral class. Remember, that's O, B, A, F, G, K, M. So that tells you the spectral class. That's the first step. Okay, so that's why we call it spectroscopic parallax. Spectroscopic, because step one, take the spectrum. So you're going to see the different patterns, and from that you can tell the spectral class. Well, from that, then, you can actually, um, well, you can use Wien's displacement law. Uh, and what this will tell you, oh, maybe we should remember uh, what the law actually is. It goes like this. Uh, it was lambda equals 2.9 times 10 to the minus 3, all that divided by t, where t was the temperature and this was the, uh, the peak wavelength. So we use Wien's law, which is this one right here, and what does this get us? That tells us, uh, maybe I'll put this little arrow here, so that tells us, um, well, it can tell us the surface temperature, in other words, the effective temperature. We can also call this the black body temperature, right? They're all the same. So first, the spectrum gives you the spectral class. That's awesome. Next, Wien's law that tells you, well, from once you know this uh, spectrum, you can sort of tell what the uh, maximum wavelength is. From there, you can guess or get the temperature. So now we have the temperature. Yeah, that's the next step. Uh, then step three, 
Well, then we actually use the HR diagram. So this Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. And the way we do this is, uh, well, let's see. That will actually get us the luminosity. Uh, maybe I'll actually just write it all out. So maybe I'll just do undo here. So um, we're going to use that to tell us the luminosity. Now, how is it that we do that? I don't know if you remember this, but if this is a main sequence star, you know, if we use the HR diagram where this is the luminosity and this over here is some sort of thing of the temperature, if we knew that it was a main sequence star, and from this stuff right here, we got the surface temperature. So let's assume that we said, oh, the surface temperature is this value right here, whatever that was in Kelvin. Well, then what you do is you go up, and assuming it's a main sequence star, you go to this, and that means then you go to the left. You can say, aha, now I know the luminosity. So that's the really key thing here. And the reason that that's the key thing is because step four, now we can use this equation. Okay, and this equation right here is uh, one that's really important. Uh, maybe I'll actually do it on a different page. Maybe that's better. So I'm just going to add a new page. I'm going to say step four. And probably the most important step, that's the sort of the whole method, is uh, use the equation. Now I've shown you this before. So use the equation b equals l over 4 pi d squared. So this right here is what you do, and that gives you the distance. Okay, so that tells you the distance. That's the whole goal. That's why we do this. Now, what do the different things mean? Well, B, if you remember, this is the apparent brightness. Now, this is easy to measure on Earth. All you have to do is put a detector out there, and you actually measure. And you'll measure the power received, that's in watts, per square meter. In other words, you have to know the area of your detector. So that one is actually easy to measure. And see, the problem is you can't go out uh, to calculate its distance. I mean, that's difficult to do without actually getting there. But d is the distance to the star. And that's going to be measured in meters. And l is the luminosity of the star. And that's going to be measured in watts. So what ends up happening then is, see, apparent brightness is easy to measure. And luminosity, you can't know that unless you go right up to the star. And then we're trying to find distance. But distance depends on apparent brightness and luminosity. So what do you do? Well, this is a clever way to get us the luminosity. Now, it's not 100% accurate, but it's not a bad method. So that's why it's a bit dodgier than the, um, than the regular parallax method. But it works pretty well. So if you can tell that a star is a main sequence star, and if you take its spectrum, you can get the spectral class. From that, you can then know its maximum wavelength. Well, that sort of comes from the spectrum. Um, and then from there, you can infer its temperature, its surface temperature. And that, you sort of, you look at the HR diagram, and whatever temperature that was, you go up to where you meet up with the main sequence stars, and then you go to the left and say, aha, that's my luminosity. And that's what we got from here. And the reason we did that is because now we can use this equation, because we just got L. So you see, once we know L, we can then solve for D, because B is easy to get. So that is how we do it. So B is super easy to measure on Earth. Like I said, it's just the power per meter squared. So um, there are limitations, though. So um, I mean, this way right here, it's this, this method. Maybe I'll write this down. This method is good. Oops, I put too many O's for some reason. Uh, this method is good for up to around approximately um, a megaparsec. In other words, one million parsecs. So that's, uh, remember, one parsec equals 3.26 light years. So that tells you that this is good for around, well, one times 3.26 is just 3.26. So we'll say it's good for around three, uh, well, mega parsecs, so three mega light years. So this is good for around three million light years. So not bad. It's a pretty good method. Okay, so I think that right there is actually something that's uh, pretty important here. So uh, that's actually how we calculate the distances using this uh, method. Okay, so I have an extra slide here that I actually didn't need for some reason. Maybe I'll just delete that one.
So this is how we actually use this method. Okay, step one, take the spectrum, that gets you the spectral class, and you can also use Wien's law then to tell the temperature. Once you have the temperature, use the HR diagram to get the luminosity. Once you know the luminosity, you can use this equation, and easy peasy, you're done. And this works for about up to one megaparsec.